Welcome back inside the Section 925 Pod Center. We are happy to wrap up our first day here at the Lafayette Art and Wine Festival with two guests. You know, of course, our Section 925 baseball insider, John Zuber, who just uh, made his way down, rushed here from Vacaville, coaching a, uh, a baseball game to get here on time. With us as well is a young man that John actually recruited to Cal from Bellarmine High School, University of California, now with your Oakland Athletics, Mark Canna. Mark, John, welcome inside the Pod Center. Awesome, man. We're ready to go. All right. So uh, first, Mark, I think the first order of business for you is how's the hip? Uh, it's really good. It's, um, it's amazing, you know, how probably only a month ago I wasn't, couldn't even run, and now I'm, uh, I'm running every day. I'm lifting weight. I'm doing so much stuff that I wasn't doing three weeks ago. It's amazing and, and kind of fun to see how well it's progressing. So we talked just, you are actually in North Carolina in a car last time we talked on the phone uh, for our last podcast with you. And uh, you know, a lot of promise, obviously, going into the season. You were, you were working out with your coach down there, your swing coach, before going to spring training. Uh, what happened that led you to, uh, to get the hip surgery? Um, I had a a little step back in spring training and I, wa I wasn't feeling good. My, I thought it was my back originally. Um, so I missed some time during the spring and then, uh, you know, I was playing sparingly in the beginning of the year, once every four days or so. Um, and every time I got in there, I was like, man, I, I, my body doesn't feel good. Like, it doesn't feel like I can swing. So, you know, I'm, I'm not that tired because I'm not playing very much. I'm like this. This doesn't feel right. You know, I should be rested. I should be feeling good, and I wasn't. And uh, we took pictures of it, and sure enough, I, I needed surgery. And uh, what's uh, your prognosis about coming back? What's what are you going to be back on the ball field? Um, well, I go back every day now. I I do my rehab program at the Coliseum um, about three or four hours a day. Um, I've started swinging. I'm running. Like I said, I'm doing so many things. Um, I, I won't be back till next year because uh, it's supposed to be a six-month recovery process. So it's definitely going to put me out for the entire year. Um, so it's going to kind of be uh, it's going to be tough to wait all off season to see how it feels, you know, playing again. But uh, I won't be back till next spring. Okay. Uh, and I don't know if you know this, Mark. Zuber has told the story of, of uh, how he recruited you, and I'd like to tell the story again, just so you can hear from his perspective. His perspective, then we'll hear you. Uh, you're at Bellarmine, and John, why don't you go ahead and, and take it from there. What did you first see Mark, and what did you see in Mark that made him, you want to bring him to Cal? I remember when I, when I first called Mark, I was sitting at, watching my uh, daughter ride her bike in Lafayette, uh, Lafayette Elementary School. She's learned how to ride on two wheels. And it was July 1st, and it was the first day that we were allowed to make phone calls. And so I remember going in and watching them in some area coach stuff and some things like that. And I went back into to the coaching staff and I said, we gotta get this guy, man. There's nobody that swings like him. The ball comes off his bat phenomenally. And they said, well, where are you gonna play him? I said, well, we play him at third or fourth in the lineup. And then he, and then he could play, <laughs> play anywhere else, you know? And uh, so I remember calling him, and I was sitting in, in the uh, in the tan bar, watching my daughter ride her bike around and trying to have a conversation with this guy and asking him who else was recruiting him, and he said Santa Barbara, and uh, I think that was about it at the time. And I said, I want to, I want to make you a golden bear somehow, and we, we figured out how to do it, and you know, it, it was all great from there. But I saw him swing, and, and the way the ball left his bat came off his bat was it wasn't like the normal guys to the opposite field to the pull side he was athletic he could run um he was a no doubt three four five hitter in my eyes in the, in the pack 12 or in the pack 10 at that time so mark from your perspective santa barbara was looking at you and then you get this call from john he's really convinced but it sounds like he might have been one of the few he was in, in all honesty um I, to give you an idea of where where I was coming from, three years leading up to before college, my junior year in high school, I'm gung ho about going to Stanford. So this this whole time I grew up going to Sunken Diamond games all the time. I'd never been to I'd never even been to Cal. 
um, rooting for Stanford. I'm like, man, I'm going to go to Stanford. And then all of a sudden, oh, guess what, Mark? Stanford doesn't like you that much. <laughs> and uh, and well, I'm like, well, well, gee, Cal like, seems to like me a lot. And, and just like Zoo said, it came off that way to me. Like, man, this guy thinks the world of me. I think the world of me. <laughs> and I'm wondering, you know, why. And these guys see how great I am. So these. This is kind of like a recurring theme throughout my career is there's like a few people who think I'm kind of good and then there's a whole, it seems like, a whole bunch of other people that don't think I'm very good. <laughs> and uh, So, I, you know, I got to Cal and I was like, this is the right place, I'm here, these are my boys, you know, I, I'm, I'm ready to go, I'm ready to go to war with these guys. So, I, I mean, any, anybody can, can go, you know, opposite field, Right center field at Cal over the track stadium, Oppo, is, is big time, and that and that's what Mark did. But you know, it, all it takes in baseball is one guy. That's it. And you would look at Mark when he was with the Marlins, and you know, I, I'm assuming John Hughes signed you with the Marlins and drafted him and all yeah. that stuff, and and he's putting up these these numbers with the Marlins, and then you're looking at the Marlins saying, wait, you guys, you know, you're the Marlins. Why don't you call him up, right? I mean, give this dude a chance. And then all of a sudden, he, you know, he gets rule five by by the A's. And, and the A's, you know, it took him a little bit, took him a little bit. I remember his first game, I think his first hit was like two inches off the top of the right center field wall or the second hit in, in the Coliseum, which, which is a poke in itself. And then it just took off from there. And arguably, you know, the rule five draft isn't, is, is, is a roll of the dice. And, and a lot of the times it's, it's pitchers that go, um, or speedy guys that can help you off the bench. There hasn't been a whole lot. George Bell is probably the best Rule 5 player ever. Um, and then you look at Mark and what he did, and out of the Rule 5 draft picks, he's got to be, I would say, in the top 8 or 10 of all time in the Rule 5 and what he's produced. And if he can continue to do that and stay healthy, I mean, this this guy's a this guy's a 20 to 30 home run guy. He's a 280 hitter, 290 hitter, 300 hitter. Only gets better. Can play the outfield. Can play third. Can play first base. I mean, what ball club doesn't want? So that that does fit what you said. The model that a lot of people don't think you're very good, but a few people really do, and some of the people that really do or don't. Win. Yeah, yeah. I think um, like like I said, I I uh, when you have so many people. Telling you, you telling, not telling you you're not good, but kind of giving you that feeling. And then if you guys have faith in you and kind of reassure that, it uh, it means a lot to you. And, and Oakland kind of got it, I think, in the same way that Zoob did. And, and, you know, I think Zoob built me up a lot in that last monologue, but uh, <laughs> um, which I really appreciate. But it, it just felt great. And when, when you play for an organization like that, like at Cal or the A's now, it's a completely different feeling, you know? I, there were so many question marks between me and my organization previously with, in our relationship, and I didn't really know what was happening with the Marlins and what was going on, and uh, I feel like with the A's, we kind of, we get where each other stands. So let, let me ask you this, because the, the A's season has been over for a while, uh, and um, Coco Crisp leaves to go to the Indians, which seemed to be in the works for a while. Now Cleveland is sort of finally running away, distancing themselves from everybody else in the Central. Uh, what did Coco mean to the A's, in your experience, uh, with the A's? And what does a Coco Crisp do for Cleveland now as they're heading towards playoffs? Uh, I mean, Coco, I would say, the guy, first of all, aside from being the flat out one of the best athletes I've ever seen, um, he does so much for a clubhouse uh, with veteran leadership. I mean, you take an organization like Oakland, like the A's, we got a lot of young guys in there, a lot of guys with not a whole lot of experience, and you got guys like Coco who completely embrace the role as, you know, the guy who's going to take these younger guys under their wing. So I think that's invaluable uh, in an organization. And come playoff time, I think that's the type of guy you know, no team is going to hesitate on that guy. So, and I think Coco has that reputation around the league. So, I think it's a great move for the Cleveland. I do too. So, we, we know that John follows baseball religiously all day, every day. I don't have to ask him this question. 
but you're still in the midst of your career and as a major leaguer. You're playing for the A's, you want the A's to do well, but in a season like this, are you still a baseball fan? Absolutely. Uh, I'm a baseball nerd in every sense of the word. I'll, you know, I'll be, I'll be watching the playoffs even though we're not there, and, and I'll be looking at this guy and I'll be pausing it, and my wife will be sitting next to me and I'll go, Look at look at this swing. Look how he stays on this ball. Like look at his stride. Like not everybody can do that. Do you understand? Do you understand that? Like th this guy's special. And I don't know. I, I love baseball. I think it's beautiful. So as uh, your team growing up was the Giants, right? Your South Bay guy. Yeah. yeah. Unfortunately. Okay. Hey, I get a lot of grief for that. But I, I tell him that I've converted my entire family and all my friends to uh, age that, fans. So. That makes sense, but now when we can talk NL West, right, this this race is probably going to come down potentially to the last series. The guy sitting next to you is a Dodgers fan. I don't know if you, if you know that, but this is a... I didn't know that. Yeah, so this guy's a Dodgers fan. He brings that up a lot on the podcast. Uh, and, and right now the Dodgers are kind of distancing themselves from the Giants, but it could end up going down to that last... Uh, that last series, how do you see the NL West working out this year? I think the Dodgers are going to run away with it. Um, uh, Rich Hill, I can't say enough about Rich Hill as a competitor, as a pitcher. That guy was a good get for them. Um, that guy will be, he's the most the most mild-mannered person off the field and then when he gets on the field he turns into like borderline psychopath level <laughs> of competitiveness and it's and it's really it's fun to watch and he's really good so I mean it, yeah do you think the blister in the end was a good thing for him because it, it, you know at 36 years old would he be having the, the success he's having now at the end of the season if he didn't have that rest in the middle of the season Oh God, I don't know how to answer that one. Um, I'm sure he would. I mean, a blister is always a tough thing. I don't, I don't really know, but it probably helped him. I mean, it, it'll be, I'm sure, you know, everybody at the length of the season and such is, is tired at the end of the season. It's always good to get a break, I'd say. You can't put yourself into a 36 year old's body. Let me tell you, it's yeah. hard. It's not as hard, not as easy as yeah. right. Oh, even with a hip problem. Reddick also goes to, to LA. What does that do for the Dodgers down the stretch? You obviously said that Dodgers are going to run away with it here at the end. What is, where does Reddick play that? Yeah, Reddick just hits. Um, you know, the guy, I, I don't know how he's doing now. I know he didn't have a great start with the Dodgers. Um, but I think good hitting is, in a way, like good pitching. Like a guy like Josh Reddick, it's only a matter of time before he goes off and finds it goes on a streak and for two weeks where he you know gets out like five times um and what he does for you defensively obviously is yeah i plus. mean and, and he's always going to be there defensively so that's a plus too he's he's a really really good baseball player uh if i put you on the spot here john what were you what we got, we're coming here in september it's coming down to the stretch your prediction for the world series was uh cubs Cubs and Nationals in the NLCS, right? With the Cubs going to the World Series and winning it this year. That's kind of a popular pick. And I think the Texas Rangers at the start, that, if I'm not mistaken. I think that's right, which would have been a, a, uh, an interesting pick when you made it. Now it seems obvious. You say Cubs and what? Cubs and Rangers. Cubs over Rangers in the, in the World Series. So, Mark, putting you on the spot. Obviously, first thing I want to ask you about is a, a little AL East, because we've got a clump of, uh, you know, Boston... Baltimore and Toronto are sort of clumped in there, and they're also in the wild card race, but they're going to play each other over the next month. How do you see the AL East working out? I mean, Boston, I see the Red Sox in the World Series. Uh, the World Series. Yeah. I I love their lineup. Their, their lineup is so good. It's so hard to get through, and I always edge on the side of offense even though it goes against uh, I guess you could say popular opinion but um, I think Big Poppy is going to go out with a bang I think everything's kind of going right for them and uh, they have that history I think they'll be there and I you know uh, Cubs Red Sox World Series would be great for baseball too two traditional powerhouses and if you had to pick one to win it I'm going to 
gonna get I'm gonna go Red Sox. I like to think that Poppy goes out with a storybook ending. I'm a big fan of the guy. Um, he's a great guy. I'd like to see him win one as, in his last season. In your time uh, in, in the big leagues so far, who's the guy that you've seen that you said, wow? Uh, probably, honestly that happens about once a week. <laughs> You're just like, wow, okay. <laughs> um, I would say, on the offensive side of the ball, I would say Josh Donaldson, watching him play, watching him hit. Um, and then, I mean, the guy's amazing. He is, he's And then, hitting like there's there's always I'd say about once a week to there's a time when I sh well I'll strike out and just walk back to the dugout and go yeah I didn't have a chance there against that guy in that spot like, is, so, there, is there a guy that you've seen that you I would say yeah uh, Felix Hernandez is amazing the fact that I mean I didn't get to play against him when he was throwing 97 to 99 miles an hour um, now he's throwing 92 and it's really hard to hit. Um, everything moves so much. It's like he's throwing a wiffle ball at you. Um, but uh, yeah, I mean, I can't imagine what it was like to face that guy when he was throwing 97. John, when you were in the bigs, I'm gonna ask you the same question. Who was the guy back in your day that you played against or you saw play on the field and you thought, geez, this guy is in a, a different world? Oh, let me interrupt. I, he's not gonna say Randy Johnson because I know he's taken him deep before. <laughs> just a, just a little lazy single up the middle. Um, you, you know what? I'm, to go on Mark, um, the Red Sox. You know, you know, Price going into his last start was seven and zero, and his last seven starts with a just above a two ERA, and he, he's making his money. And uh, you know, with Price and somebody like that on the mound, uh, the the calm that comes over the team. When, when that guy comes out there is just unbelievable and it, it, it's super super cool and, and the calm you feel as as a player is is phenomenal but you know for me the guys watching Tony Gwynn was an unbelievable hitter and I remember talking to him when he would get down to first base and 